Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Homage to him, the holy one, the worthy one, the holy enlightened one, Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. So tonight, we are going to play with the Kinti Sutta. We may have done this once before, um, a year or a year and a half ago or something like that. But um, I want to work my way into this. I think I've given you the new uh, work that I did on the front of this. So mine will be almost identical, but you'll get the gist of it from what you have, OK? Um, so first we start with, we have to work our way into this because how do we learn the Dhamma is the first part of this. How do we learn the Dhamma? Well, what I really like, what I found in the suttas that I really like is in the Upanisa Sutta, the way it ends. The Upanisa Sutta uh, is the one that we have discussed before that has dependent origination in it. But it also has not just the line of the 12 links, it also has the line of 12 more links, which have to do with your development. And the way that the sutta ends is special because it is very indicative of how we actually learn this Dhamma. So listen carefully because it we learn the Dhamma just the way the water reaches the ocean. Just as when rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top, the water flows down along the slopes and fills the cleft and the gullies and the creeks. And these being full feel, fill up the pools and these being full fill up the lakes and these being full fill up the streams and these being full fill up the rivers and these being full fill up the great ocean that is how you are learning the dhamma when you're working with me anyway and working with others i'm hoping that is the way that you're learning you are learning in the pieces that connect together eventually to end up with an ocean of knowledge and wisdom. But it happens that sometimes people come to practice and learn the Dhamma and they want to ask a question that is way far along the progress of this without having been told or learned the pieces that built up to that point. And I like Buddha Dasa in Thailand because he came up with a saying. I think we should all remember it when we are teaching. And that is that it's not a good idea to climb a tree by starting at the top. You cannot know the tree if you try to climb the tree from the top. You have to go from the roots of the tree and in this training, you have to have the knowledge of the roots and the sap and the inner bark and the outer bark and the whole tree and work your way to the top. That's how this is working. And it's kind of contrary, isn't it? Because we are asking you to work to go deeper and deeper and deeper. But I'm telling you that if you're climbing the tree to reach the highest point, of understanding, you have to start with pieces and fit together at the bottom first. This is how we learn the Dhamma. Patience leads to Nibbana. Full understanding of how everything works leads to the wisdom, the not connection of knowledge and wisdom that you're seeking. Now, the psychological advisor side of the Go Gotama Buddha offers us a system of knowledge and experience that leads to a life of prevention of suffering 
through wisdom, careful attention, and carefully letting go of unwholesomes and adopting wholesome mind states. We have to go into the suttas for our answers. That's in our tradition, we have to go to the suttas first for the answers. Apply them into our life, use them as many as much as possible, and take what operates for us to relieve our suffering in life. Now, I just talked with someone who's one of my students, and I said, how is your meditation going? Who immediately told me that there wasn't that much time for sitting, but I wasn't asking him basically how many times he sat at that point. I asked him in the front, how is your practice going? Meaning in your life, are you using it all the time? That's the big question. Because for the lay person, the relief from the levels of day-to-day -day suffering can happen if we only take the practice into life and apply it to everything we do. So that's what then he started talking, and then I found out it is helping him in daily life. Then we talked about, and when was your uh, most recent sitting in the past week? And how did that go? What's the most report here? What's, and then what is the challenge right now for you? And then let's look at the solution for that. So we have to get back together to look at the solution, which has to do with an issue of positions in sitting which we can work out, I believe. We'll have to see step by step. So recently I've had several calls about difficulties with young people and parents that have been facing uh, the, still the issues that happen in COVID-19 lockdowns. And this has been the largest universal lockdown situation for the human race recorded in modern history. This is a fact. But I don't know if we ever considered going into this thing, what it was going to be like at the other end with those who had died, those who had gotten sick, those who had residual conditions after being sick and such as that. So there are many, many things people go through. And we talked about many ways of handling this. The question is, does the Buddha offer any applicable forms of relief in his suttas that we can find and apply to our situations today? And the truth is, yes, in every situation and interaction that we have, we can uh, look at that and immediately six are it and then see what's really essential in the situation, let go of the unessential part of it, choose a response, dealing with loving kindness, forgiveness, compassion, loving kindness. I like to do it that way. Someone said, um, why? <laughs> because if you forgive it as you're going into it, if it's starting to make you tense and tight, just forgive it. It's going to pass. And Nietzsche says it's going to change. So just forgive the tightness of, oh, we're here. Why do we have to deal with this? That's the forgiveness that kind of forgiveness. Compassion, we defined as active confession, is seeing the person in pain, me. <laughs> Giving yourself enough space to have that pain, supporting yourself as best you can with the knowledge you have about how things work, and putting loving kindness into the situation for yourself and for others around you. So the the instructions I just said, we usually say toward the other person. Now I'm saying it to yourself. So one example in this, I think I left this in there in the new type part, but I, I can came to ask you what I should do to help my father get along better and work together as a team to get through the uh, COVID-19. And some people are still living together in housing as a result of losing jobs and other things. I'm having trouble with uh, my teenage children and I'm not sure how to handle this because some of the grades are slipping and the communication is tense in the family because it feels like things are just starting to fall down around us. We're facing new financial issues now, facing new problems with um, the uh, 
sort of Cold War added Cold War feeling coming back with what happened in the Ukraine somewhat. And um, the answer I guess meditation and the Brahma Viharas can help in these kinds of situations. They definitely can. But how can the meditation help in a situation like this? Well, the first thing we have to look at is what the meditation turned out to be that the Buddha decided to teach. We know, and we hear a lot about the monks were trying to reach the proper conditions so they could experience uh, Nibbana. And in order to do this, they first had to learn how to communicate with their brain and communicating with themselves and their brain so that it would carry out, the brain would carry out intentions whenever they lean towards a wholesome direction. How, how effective do you want that to be? How much do I have to practice that? I tried to figure out a good simile to explain that. I was at one point, uh, was living on a farm, taking care of a bunch of very beautiful thoroughbred horses, jumpers that were trained. And I was allowed to have a small cabin to exercise these horses, but I was only to exercise them, water them, feed them, clean them. Yes. Okay. But then I was also allowed to ride one or two of those horses. And one day I got a bit mixed up. <laughs> I, I chose a horse that looked just like the one I was supposed to ride. And I got on the horse and rode it and it didn't feel quite the same. It felt very, very smooth, you know. And um, I got the horse down to where there was a big, they had a big ring, but they don't have a fence around it. They just had barrel markers around this very, very large ring where we train the horses uh, for what is called dressage. Now, dressage has a book and it has a set of patterns for your horse like three step, four steps forward, stop, four steps back, four steps to the right, four steps to the left, back here, four steps back, four steps forward, stop. That might be one of the exercises, very precise. I didn't know I was on a champion dressage horse at the time. But when I stopped the horse and I rested, I shifted my weight forward. The moment I shifted my weight forward, the, the horse very gently started walking one, two, three, four. Then I sat back, they stopped. I thought I picked the wrong horse, but I wonder how this works. And I just leaned backwards. One, two, three, four, five, stop. One, two, three, four, stop. Shift your leg down on the right. The horse moves to the right, four steps. Shift it again, four steps. Shift it again, four steps. It was really amazing experience. I then rode the horse back to the barn. Wondered if I should tell her when she came out that I was riding and she did find out. But she wasn't upset, you know, it wasn't that the horse was wild or anything like that. But the horse was worth over twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars. I had no idea, you know. But it was a very funny thing. I remember this because the point is, how much do we want to practice so that our brain will lean into a wholesome direction? The answer is we only want to lean in our mind and go in that direction. Lean in the other way and go in that direction. That's all we want to do. And you can do this. We know this now because students have left the retreats and kept doing the practice as we instructed them all the time in everything they're doing. And about two months later called and said, Sister Kama, I'm calling you because I want to know what just happened. I said, well, what happened? This and so-and-so said this to me and, and got usually I got really upset and nothing happened. So this was equanimity. Yeah, this was equanimity. 
And the thing was when the person started coming toward this person and they were sort of upset, they had no reaction and just six hard like that with their brain, six hard right away. They didn't six hard, the brain six hard. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about purifying the mind, the first part of the six R's and retraining the mind by replacing what you let go of and relax from the relaxed smile and come back is a step of purification and retraining. So you're automatically doing that. Can anybody do it? Yes. You just have to do it and do it and do it and do it and do it the same way every time. That's all. So we must set up a trust with the brain in order to do that. That's why I make friends with the brain. And it's been working very hard to help protect us through life. And the one thing we need to learn about the brain is that, and I think I wrote in your, your I, I can't look at this the same time this time, I'm not gonna just read it to you. So I'm sort of going through it. Um, as we begin to communicate with the brain, we're asking it to take a chance and allow us to steer our life a bit more as we begin to see how everything is actually working. This is what we're doing. And um, do you mean that the brain was trying to protect us before? Yes, I do. This is part of the job of your brain. Part of the job of the brain is to protect us. And the protection, it stays alert whenever you have, for instance, sudden reactions take place and you might have an accident. Without instructions, the brain helps you. And we don't usually realize how something is happening in just the same way um, each time it happens before in the past. We don't realize that what we're doing it picks up sights, sounds, odors, tastes, or touch, or thoughts uh, that are similar and the to what happened in the past, and then it re-stimulates them the same way and causes you to fall into reaction, which is the bawa, falling into the action and give birth to the reaction that came up before again and again and again. Now, most of you probably know someone who has a behavior pattern that's really irritating to everybody, something, children have this happen, but adults end up with them also if they don't, you know, clean it up during the time they're growing up. And so the only way to change these is to learn how to let them go and then replace them the same way every time with an alternative pattern of behavior. Eventually the new neural pathway in your brain is adopted and then the old one fades out from lack of use and the person can change. It's a matter of how old you are, how often and how hard you have to work at this, but over 25, it takes a lot more than if you're under 25 to change a pattern, but it can be done. The point is in this research that nobody is stuck. We may have thought they were stuck, but they're not stuck. And they can change if they put the energy into doing it. So you mean that we're repeating past reactions over and over again? Yes, I do mean that. Human beings react about 80 to 85% of the time in life to what is unessentially going on instead of realizing what is essentially happening. And um, in the present time event, we're not always working with what's really going on. We just automatically go back and react the way we did before. So this is why a person gets unconsciously caught up in reacting in the same way each time. Causing, uh, they can't see the essential challenge in, in an event and they just keep repeating or looping. My daughter told me we can't say they're repeating or playing the recording again anymore. <laughs> She's a psychologist. She told me, mom, that's called looping. So we're in the computer age, looping. Gee, 
why, why don't we learn about this in school? Well, the reason, you know, I've been asking myself that question for the past 10 or 12 years now. Our kids really don't uh, get this in their health class education in the East or in the West. And that's why uh, they can easily be led to do what other people want them to do because they don't understand that they have the capacity to change and live alternative patterns of behavior. So how do we stop the reactions? How can we change? Well, we have to understand how the reactions occur first. This is what uh, the Bodhisattva was spending six years attempting to figure out what is this suffering? And any time that we wanna change something in our behavior, <coughs> we have to honestly, See the habit looping first. And then once we see how this is working, we can change it. And that's where Buddhism is really cool because when we talk to you about dependent origination, that's why we're showing you seven of those links reveal how suffering is actually happening in day-to-day -day events. And then we change. Well, for a moment, maybe you change if you know how it works. But if we really want to change our behavior, we need to see the arising of the old habit. Think a moment, never mind the moment we let go of it. Just never mind, never mind. It helps you. Um, and you let go of the attention on it. Relax your head and smile as we replace it with different wholesome kinds of responses. And this really begins to change. This is where real change starts to happen with the repetition. And this will make things better for us and others around us. And as we begin purifying and retraining the brain at the same time, we are solidifying this new communication system, a new old communication system that's in our brain and at works between our brain and body. Is this good for us to do this? It's super good, in my opinion, because when you get uptight and tension, when somebody asks you to do something that you don't wanna do, your heart pumps faster, your circulation speeds up, and you feel heat in your body, and you, um, you want to get defensive immediately, and ready to pounce back at the other person because it feels uh, like this is happening to you. It always feels like it's happening to you. This is the heavy part of living. So you get defensive and you want to fight back because you're in a defensive position. Your parents are worrying a lot about you because school stopped and you were ripped out of normal teenage cycles due to COVID. This has happened to many, many teenage kids here in India and all over the world. You might also have been knocked off course when over here, when you had a large house and the maid and the cook that you know, where the father, mother, everybody's working and the maids and the cooks that are in the household, they left and went back to the village. If there was no one before, because uh, they went home to their village when the lockdowns happened, it was the first thing many of them just did. One resort town, everybody left. The resort community and the town operated strictly on people from out of town. It was empty. And finally, it comes back. After COVID, it starts to come back. People start to return. But the house was still here when this happened to you. And the living situation is now in need of group cooperation until things normalize. This is important. And everybody needs to work together in this group situation. And there is also a lot of pressure put on young people who had routines before the lockdowns that are different but now things have changed. And here's a clear lesson of a Nietzsche for you all to watch. Suddenly everything changes. And even now you need a meeting each week. Suddenly 
or so just to see how things are going. How are they changing to understand that to survive is the most important thing and everyone has to help. So we're all were thrown into this position. How should we work together to get along better in our living groups? Well, for this, we can go to a section of the Upanisha Sutta, I think I may have read this to you before, uh, where Anuruddha is telling the Buddha how he and three other monks managed to live together in harmony. But this is a very application, uh, applicable story for anyone to read. And I shared it in Malaysia with some Boy Scout troops before they went on a camp out and they said everything went a bit better. The Buddha is speaking here to some of the monks living together and he says to them, I hope that you are still living in accord with mutual appreciation without disputing with each other and blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. As to that, I think thus, this is what Anuruddha says, it is a gain for me. It is a great gain. Oops. Just one second. Hi, I'm in a class. I'll be free at 8.15. Okay? Okay. Um, as to that, Anaruta says, I... There, I, I killed the phone. I'm good at killing computers, but I usually don't kill the phone. <laughs> but just for you, I killed the phone. Okay. Uh-oh, I may have broken a precept. I wasn't supposed to kill the phone. <laughs> I turned the phone off. There you go. Okay, Anna Ruta said this. As to that question, I think thus. It is a gain for me, it is a great gain for me that I am living with such companions in this life. I maintain bodily acts of loving kindness towards these other people, both openly and privately. I maintain verbal acts of loving kindness towards the other people, both openly and privately. I maintain mental acts of loving kindness towards both these people both openly and privately. And I consider why should I not set aside what I personally wish to do and do what these other people wish to do instead. And then I set aside what I wish to do and do what these other persons wish to do. We are different in our bodies, but in one mind, we live together. And that's, I have rewritten slightly, you know, this was being talking about the monks living together, but in house situation, that is what needs to be read. That is what needs to be passed around for everyone to get together. And how do you abide here? The Buddha asks. Now he talks about it in reference to the monks themselves, but whichever of us returns from the village with alms food prepares the seats set out sets out the water for the drinking and for the washing and puts the refuse bucket back in its place. And whichever of us returns last eats any food left. And if he wishes otherwise, they throw it away where there is no greenery or drop it into water where there is no life. He puts away the seats and the water for drinking and for washing he puts away that refuse bucket after washing it and sweeps out the refectory. Whoever notices that the pots of water for drinking, washing, and the latrine are low or empty takes care of them. If they are too heavy for one person, he calls someone else by a signal of the hand and they move it together by joining hands. But because of this, we do not break out into speech. But every five days, we sit together all night long discussing the Dhamma. And that is how we abide diligent, ardent, and resolute. 
And this is a great example of cooperation in living. And here it was practiced um, in silent, selfless cooperation in all the work that was needed to be done to live together in peace. Now, the second place I would take you outside of this sutta to see something is about how to behave when one is not in accord with another person. About discussing some Dhamma point, but we could take this into life and say it was about discussing anything. And we see here, people were advised very specifically how to manage that situation with kindness, with forgiveness, kindness, uh, and uh, compassion and kindness uh, through the whole situation. In the Kinti, K-I-N-T-I Sutta, although the story is around the mind, it is true that the monks faced many of the same things that you and I face living together as a group. So when one is in his stage in life where he is thinking more of himself than of the others in the group, disputes can arise. Just like they can arise within any family. So when you listen to this, Put yourself in one of the places in the story. We hear what the Buddha taught as good foundation training uh, that all people should universally hear as well. And we find there are 37 requisites of awakening um, in section three of this, just like we teach when we're learning about your twin practice. We have a foundation amount of dhamma that we need at the minimum for you to understand so that your practice is supported correctly and it will work. And then the sutta shows us how putting these to work together in uh, your practice can result in a mutual appreciation of how each person is doing well in the group or having some kind of difficulty that we should stop and help one another with. So there is an example of communication where each person differs about the meaning of the phrasing and of what is said, how we say it. That's one of my sore spots. Communication is really a difficult thing in any language for anyone in life. You think of what you want to say, and you know what you mean. So then you say it to me. But when I hear what you say, you can only watch me if you can see me. And you can hope that when I hear, you hear, uh, when, I, when I hear what you say, that I understand the meaning in the same way as you meant it when you said it, there goes the communication. That's why we get in so much trouble because we're all different. We grew up differently, we hear things differently and that's communication. There is an example of communication where each person differs about the meaning and the phrases of what is said. And then if attempting to live in concord when one person commits an offense or a transgression, we are shown how they should handle it to maintain harmony without resolving an issue makes it impossible to experience Nibbana. In the case of our own situations, reaching Nibbana could mean for us at this time, attempting to reach a personal goal in our life. It could mean remaining popular with our school friends when we're outside of school or work or remaining in touch with the best contacts for work positions so that we don't slip behind on our career path. Or it could mean keeping balance with other dedicated domestic engineers running a household or home executives with very large households 
And when we fall behind in our progress, it is often because of what is caught inside of us about some past dispute. We don't want to let go of this when it happens in us. We'd like in, in our living situations. We don't want to get stuck in the same way as with any monk or nun, the same thing is true. But if we don't resolve any disputes as advised by the Buddha, then it is impossible to have good sleep, good health, good attention for tasks that we do, for even good communication. We can't make the best progress in life when we carry inside of us restlessness, guilt, and remorse from unsettled disputes. So when we try to live without solving this, we face the weight of suffering of something said or done in present time due to the weight of not forgiving others or forgiving ourselves. In our own settings, we need to give and receive forgiveness and keep on going without any baggage from our past. In section 16 of the Kinti Sutta, it becomes clear that without abandoning disputes, if one were to exalt themselves above others or disparage someone else in any living situation, one will not attain success when they apply it to the path that one is attempting to follow. So the bottom line here is in section 17, for the sake of all young and older people working now through school levels or handling the growth of careers, it is the utmost importance that the lessons discussed here are just as valuable for lay people as they are for any monastic or government group either. Now, although I taught you this in the form of the bhikkhus living a lesson, the same is true for any group of people living together in any situation. And so just listen now. This is the Kinti Sutta. What do you think about me? Thus, I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Kusanara in the Grove of the Offerings. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied, and the blessed one said this, what do you think about me, bhikkhus, that the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of robes, or that the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of alms food? Or do you think that the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of having a resting place? Or that the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of being a better state of being? We do not think thus about the Blessed One. The recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma for the sake of robes or for the sake of alms or for the sake of a resting place or the sake of some better state of being. So, bhikkhus, do you not think thus about me, that I teach the Dhamma for these reasons? Venerable sir, we think thus about the Blessed One, that the Blessed One is compassionate and seeks our welfare. He teaches the Dhamma out of compassion. So, monks, you think that about me. The Blessed One is compassionate and seeks our welfare. He teaches the Dhamma out of compassion. So monks, these things that I have taught you after directly knowing them, that is the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right kinds of striving, which includes right effort, the four bases of spiritual power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven enlightenment factors and the noble eightfold path. These things you should all train in accord, in concord together. 
with mutual appreciation without disputing. And while you are training in concord with mutual appreciation without disputing, two monks might make different opinions about a higher part of the Dhamma. Now, if you should think thus, these monks, these venerable ones, they differ in both the meaning and the phrasing. Then whichever monk you think is the more reasonable should be approached and addressed in this way. The venerable ones differ about both the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason there is difference about the meaning and the difference about the phrasing. Let them not fall into a dispute. And then whichever monk you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed in this way. The venerable ones differ about the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is difference about the meaning and the difference about the phrasing. Let them not fall into dispute. So what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped, bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped as wrongly grasped, what is dhamma and what is discipline should be expounded. So basically the Buddha left us the book of discipline to help us settle in matters that there were disputes, but in the matter of dhamma, he left us the suttas to go back to, to see specifically how these things work and to work them through together with the objective of having a practice that was easy to understand, immediately effective here and now, inviting deeper inspection and would be untouched by time. So we're always seeking the Dhamma Sukha, we're always seeking how to help you have a practice that's actually operating correctly so that it moves easily towards the path for you to start down the path, the noble path, um, the, the, the path towards Nibbana. Now, if you should think thus, these monks, these venerable ones differ about the meaning, but agree about the phrasing that whichever monk you think is the more reasonable should be approached and addressed thus, the venerable ones differ about the meaning, but they agree about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason there is a difference about the meaning, but agreement about the phrasing. Let them not fall into dispute. Whichever monk you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable one differs about the meaning but agree about the phrasing. And the venerable ones should know that it is for this reason, there's a difference about the meaning, but agreement about the phrasing and let them not fall into dispute. So the effort of the entire sutta is not to fall into dispute. So what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped, seen as it is, stops that which stops the operation of the realization, the operation of the, the, um, the Dhamma and the meditation working in a parallel way, supporting each other. And what has been rightly grasped should be borne in mind as rightly grasped. So bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped or wrongly grasped and bearing in mind what has been rightly grasped and rightly grasped, what is Dhamma and what is discipline should be expanded. We should look into the Dhamma discipline also for a balancing, if we can find anything there to see if there's anything that can help us to balance this. So in the morning in retreats, when you're with us, we have a phrase. It's important about the essential and the unessential to see the essential as the essential, to see the unessential as the unessential. So 
what is essential and what is unessential, what is what operates well, what doesn't operate well, how is this so? In discovering that, we are discovering and experiencing direct knowledge by testing everything that a guide tells you. Everything, no matter who they are, no matter what their attainment is, they should be acting as a guide with the student to simply help them in the operation so that they can move along clearly without having to think, think, think all the time. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is this right? Is this wrong? That's why it's important to stop and attempt to try to work it out. Now, if you think thus, these venerables agree about the meaning, but differ about the phrasing, then whichever bhikkhu you think is the more reasonable should be approached and addressed thus. And the venerable ones agree about the meaning, but they differ about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it's for this reason that there is an agreement about the meaning, but a difference about the phrasing. But the phrasing is a mere trifle. Let the venerable ones not fall into dispute over a mere trifle. And then whichever bhikkhu you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part they should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones agree about the meaning, but differ about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is agreement about the meaning, but difference about the phrasing. But the phrasing is a mere trifle. Let the venerable ones not fall into a dispute over mere trifles. So what has been rightly grasped should be borne in mind as rightly grasped and what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped. Bearing in mind that what has been rightly grasped is rightly grasped and bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped is wrongly grasped. What is the Dhamma and what is the discipline should be expounded. This is the point where you teach how it works well. Each time in the situation in the sutta, it's where you teach how it works well to support your ability to see it, to grow your knowledge and vision, to grow the knowledge into the highest level of wisdom. <clears throat> so while you are training in accord with mutual appreciation without disputing some monk, might commit an offense or a transgression. They might get angry. They might. <laughs> so now, monks, you should not hurry to reprove him or her. Rather, the person should be examined thus. I shall not be troubled and the other person will not be hurt, for the other person is not given to anger and resentment. He is not firmly attached to his view and he relinquishes it easily. He lets it go easily. And I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. If such occurs in you monks, it is proper for you to speak. If you can show them in a simple way how one thing is leading to problems, but the other thing is leading to freeing the mind. Think about when we talk about hindrances. This is a good example. And then it may occur to you, monks, I shall not be troubled by the other person. I I'm sorry, I shall not be troubled, but the other person will be hurt for the other person is given to anger and resentment easily. However, he is not firmly attached to his view. He relinquishes it easily. I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. It is a mere trifle that the other person will be hurt, but it is a much greater thing if I can help the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. So if such occurs to you monks or nuns, it is proper to speak, proper to speak. But then, it may occur to you that I shall be troubled, but the other person will not be hurt. But the one other person is not given to anger and resentment. Though he is firmly attached to his view, 
he relinquishes it with difficulty, yet I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. It is a mere trifle that I shall be troubled, but it is a much greater thing that I can help that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. And in such occurs to you that way, it is proper to speak. Now then it may occur to you, I shall be troubled and the other person will be hurt. And if the other person is given to anger and resentment, and he is firmly attached to his view and he relinquishes it with great difficulty, yet I can make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome, it is a mere trifle that I shall be troubled and the other person hurt, but it is a much greater thing if I can help the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. If such occurs to you, it is proper to speak. So all these ways it is proper to speak um, if you use similes and things and you're not pointing the finger and saying fault and you know this way and that way. Um, Unfortunately, today, some people decide to hear, no matter what you try and say, that you're saying that um, they're wrong and you're right without examining things. But we have to hope in the future that we have to look carefully at the person and see if we should do this or not. Let's see what else happens. And then it may occur to you, I shall be troubled and the other person will be hurt. For the other person is given to anger and resentment. He is firmly attached to his view. He relinquishes it with difficulty. I cannot make the person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the wholesome. One should not underrate equanimity toward this such a person. This is where you apply equanimity. You leave them alone. You let them go in their own way. You don't go and speak. And while you are training in accord with mutual appreciation without disputing, there might arise mutual verbal friction, insolence in views, mental annoyance, bitterness, and dejection. And then whichever one you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the one part should be approached and addressed thus. While we were training in accord, friend, with mutual appreciation, without disputing, there arose mutual verbal friction. And there was insolence in views and mental annoyance, bitterness and dejection. If the recluse knew that, he would censure that. And answering rightly, the monk would answer thus, while we were training, if the recluse knew that this was occurring this way between us, one cannot realize Nibbana. Your practice cannot work if this is going on. Then whichever monk you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed while we were training in accord friend with mutual appreciation without disputing. There arose mutual verbal friction, insolence in views, mental annoyance, bitterness, and even dejection where I think this way, you think your way, even though it's stupid. That's dejection, pushing them away and putting them down. That's not, that's not right. If the recluse knew, would he censure that? Answering rightly, the bhikkhu would answer thus, while we were training in this way, and he describes it again, if the recluse knew of this, he would censure this and say, stop. And we have the example of the Kasambian Sutta where the Buddha simply left because the monks were fighting with each other and he censured the whole thing. He left the rains retreat and went elsewhere for that rains retreat. Where he went to stay was with Anuruddha and Kimbala and Nambia.
But friend, without abandoning that thing, can one realize Nibbana? And the answering rightly, the, bit, the monk would answer, thus friend, without abandoning this whole thing, one cannot realize Nibbana. If others should ask a monk thus, was it the venerable one who made those monks emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome? Answering rightly, the bhikkhu would answer here, friends, I went to the blessed one. Blessed one taught me the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, I spoke to the bhikkhus, the monks. The monks heard the Dhamma as I said it to them, and they emerged from the unwholesome and became established in the wholesome. And answering in this way, the monk neither exalts himself nor disparages others. He answers in accordance with the Dhamma in such a way that nothing which provides a ground for censure can be legitimately deduced from his assertion when he speaks to the monks. And so that is what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied, delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this is a case of as teachers, we are expected to actually explain as best we can from the Dhamma, what is working and what is wholesome and why it works well, and not argue from our personal position, this or that. If we're in question, we should go back to the discipline and the Dhamma and our basically place of going back to the discipline in our tradition is going back to the suttas. Looking at the suttas, I know that now when I was teaching, when I was starting to practice and I was studying with Bhante, everything came from the Majjhima Nikaya because we took the Majjhima Nikaya closely to ourselves because that is where Bhante had just the Majjhima Nikaya and went and figured out how to put together the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. He was not alone with the idea. At first, it was just, that's the book he had and that's what he was going to use. We're very, 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 very lucky. I've thought this many, many times that Bhikkhu Bodhi translated the Majjhima Nikaya first in, in 1995. If he had taken the Samyutta Nikaya, I don't think this would have happened, that this would have been found. It would not have been as easy to put it together. But Bhikkhu Bodhi made something very interesting in the front of the Majjhima Nikaya. And it's a fascinating, if you've never been, you know, gone to officially study Buddha Dhamma, to go in to make, take the time in the Majjhima Nikaya to go through some, I think it's basically 65 pages. Yeah, I think it's 65 pages. And after that, there is a, let's see, I can tell you, wait, okay. There's up to 65 pages, which includes a basic pronunciation for Pali and gives you some key terms where he has changed some of the terminology from the way Nanamoli had, had to translate a few things that he shows you. But it's basically 60 pages of information about this Nikaya. Why is it considered so important? Because in it, he explains that the Majjhima Nikaya holds the whole teaching. And the other books that were written the other Nikayas have support systems for what is in the whole of the teaching. So in our case, we were very lucky because the few of us that were following him very closely in teaching us, we learned from the Majjhima Nikaya first, then the Samyutta Nikaya was translated. And we heard from Maurice Walsh's Digga Nikaya for certain suttas that were always taught, very some important suttas that were always taught. And the last one that came 
was en gutra nikaya. When we look at samyutta nikaya, we see a book that is a different structure from the uh, majjhima nikaya. The majjhima nikaya is very special in its own way because it, it allowed us as Americans, we were Americans doing this, and it allowed us the opportunity to meet all the people, to meet the people that we didn't grow up with, we didn't learn about in stories, we didn't have Jataka tales, we didn't hear about all their names. It was a very funny experience for me not too long back when I think it was, maybe it was a while back, but I think it was in 2015, maybe. I was in Colombo in Sri Lanka and a dear friend, she took me when there were 10,000 people in line, she took me to the front of the line and I got to go in to see the relics for all 17 or 18 arahats, including Ananda. And this man came up to me and he was in a beautiful, you know, a beautiful tuxedo with a cumberland, you know, around center, really nice. He was going to tell me the story of each one. And he looked at me and he said, why are you crying? I was so, the energy was so amazing in that place. Absolutely amazing. And I said, I know, I know, that's Hariputta. And he went to the next one. I know, that's Mogulana. I know, that's, that's Ananda. I know, that's Kimberly. I know this one, Nampia. I knew their names from, from the Majim and Nikaya. We need to know these people. We're real. They were here. That's Pune. I remember Pune. I got to go to Pune's what was left of the, uh, the burial place for Pune, which is near uh, where we are here in Mumbai. It's not far away. It's about an hour and a half away. And they're restoring it because they found where it was and figured out which one it was. It's, it's just fantastic to learn the stories of these people. In this text, what Bonte has done is taken 76 suttas as the source for what he figured out. And amongst those 76 out of the 152, he's taken 22 of them that feed us the necessary foundation information we need and the support material to support that practice so that it moves along easily on that path. Your part with the instructions, your part with going down that path, take your time, take your time. It works different for each person. Don't push it all, have fun with it, smile, use the practice all the time. If you use the practice all the time, then what will happen is your mind will go automatic. It'll start taking care of that part of it. And you just watch. This, this practice is meant for you to be able to float through and allow the flowers to bloom. And the flowers are each one of the levels you pass through. You don't struggle to go anywhere. In fact, when you get into the fourth jhana and then you're going into the mental realms, you should just personally get out of the way and watch. Bonte used to tell me all the time, watch the show. It's better than any show in town. And where it leads, if you sit on a regular basis, it sits and it uplifts you and it makes it so that you can see things. And even if you're not perfect, you make mistakes. You immediately feel it. You take your precepts again, forgive yourself, try again. That's what we're all doing, all of us. You go as far as you can with your understanding. You see? The echoing things in my mind that stick with me the most is stop trying, get out of the way. <laughs> as if I was trying to go in something 
I was trying, and that's the whole gist of it. If I would just watch, the mind is loving this practice. It is loving this practice. There should be no pressure. We're not demanding you do anything. We don't put any expectations on you. I know sometimes we heard Bhante talk about, you know, here this happened, here that happened. Irrelevance. It's irrelevant. The best and most wonderful retreat I ever did was with a group of people who did exactly what I told them to do and nothing else in the instructions, followed everything to the letter. If I asked them to do it a half hour more, they do it a half hour more. And the real progress in that retreat was not those that actually went through a rebooting of the mind a restart where everything went back to default, which is essentially what's happening with Nibbana. The past of your life is disappearing completely unthought of at all. The future and the worries are disappearing completely not worried about it all. You're just right there. You're just watching and you keep going. And when you do this, allow your mind you're allowing it to be free to do this. There's no pressure. There's no tension. You are moving away from tension every time you do the steps properly. If you're building tension, you're not doing them properly. If you have a headache, you need to talk to a guide. If you have tinnitus in your ears, it's too much concentration. You see, if you have headaches, there's a reason you've decided internally from before from something else. I have to go there. You don't have to. You will. You will go there. And the reason you will is because if you stay back and watch, you're in a canoe and you're going down a river and you're going to reach the ocean. Essentially, that's what this is. You will. And so what was it that was so great in those retreat, that retreat that was so wonderful to see on the charts at the end of that retreat? These are women who were attempting to pray and they were praying for 30 minutes, 45, maybe an hour the most in their whole life. And they'd been practicing to pray for six or seven years really hard. And all of a sudden they were able to rest and just watch for anywhere from three to five hours by the end of that retreat. So even if somebody didn't have the complete change happen at the end, the rebooting process, if they just keep going, it will happen. A month after the retreat, when I followed them, the best part of this was of the 16 of them, most of them were still using this in their life all the time. No more petty arguments in the kitchen. No more deciding who's going to do the floor and who's going to clean the refectory and who's going to clean the dining hall. No more. Everything was running smoothly. Nitpicky stuff had all stopped. Why? Because they understand from the Dhamma they were learning, they, from, the, from the information, the supportive foundation information they're learning, they're learning how to let go and live. Would they come out the other side smiling? People are saying, what are you doing? What have you just learned? Where did you learn that? We had a funny answer. Oh, it's nothing really. It's just about prayer because we were teaching it in a bridge work project. And this knowledge that I'm teaching you, this knowledge that I'm showing you is bridge work possibility. The bridge work to a Christian church or even anyone. Because why? Because this is about a human being freeing themselves. And as you free your mind, you free your body to heal. You free your body to rest. You free your body not to need as much food as it did before. And you start getting free of a lot of things. In your life, you become clearer. And you become liking life. That's what we see happening. So now it's your floor. You've got 15 minutes. How are you doing? 
questions. Anybody have questions? Hey, you, how you doing? Hello. Uh, yes, yeah, Sister Kima, I, do, I have uh, a couple of questions on the sutta. Uh -huh. If we go, if we go back to paragraph five, where there was uh, uh, the difference in both meaning and phrasing. Yeah. Um, when the, when you've got reasonable members of both parties together, it, it says. Um, it, that you, they need to recognize that there's, uh, they, they differ about the meaning and the phrasing. Mm -hmm. And then it says, uh, let them not fall into dispute. So not, let's, let's not make this a, a reason for falling out. Um, but then it says, so what should be, so what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped. But how do they come to the understanding of what is wrongly grasped? Yeah, this, this is interesting because it proves the point that I'm always saying about the practice. The, um, you know, none of us, I don't care who we're talking about, what big monk anywhere in the world right now, none of us have been in the time of the Buddha while this was all going on. And none of us can really genuinely say this is it or this is not it. It should never be said. It has been said in some places where I said it shouldn't be said. <laughs> You know, and it has popped out and I've tried very hard not to do that. Yeah, because you know what? Nobody knows. So, you know, what it comes down to, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is does it operate for you or doesn't it? Does it actually work and follow through the way it's described as it's easy to understand, immediately effective here and now, inviting you to go deeper and it seems to be untouched by time. Any place you put it on the timeline, it would have worked. This is where the whole part of the meditation comes down to one tiny thing. Does it operate or doesn't it operate? Do you oh. let go of your atta and fall into anatta perspective smoothly? You know, one examination, one example of this, uh, what you're talking about is saying, um, formations or fabrications yeah formations or fabrications there's a few words so the one translation would say fabrications but the translation on the other side we we agree with the formations and the person you know if most of the people see it as just a formation then we need, to, we need to try and express to the person who's saying fabrication, why would we object to that? So that you can see now, whether they accept it or not, it can't be important to you. That's another thing. There's a lot of this going around in the world right now. You have to see it my way or go on the highway. And that's what he, the Buddha was trying to stop. It's my way or the highway. Nobody ever said that in Dhammasukha. But that's what people take it as sometimes. And I think it's very, very sad, very sad, okay? That when we take something that way, but what it does come down to, does it, I would like to take it to where the Buddha said to Ananda another time, Ananda said, what is there good meditation? Is there bad meditation? So what did the Buddha say? He basically said, it's good meditation if you can get to the path easily and go down and experience Nibbana. It's not good meditation if you can't get to the path easily and go down to experience Nibbana. That's all he said. He wouldn't say any more. That's all. I can't remember exactly where that is. I'd quote it if I can't remember, but I remember I was impressed with this. He would not say anything more. Sarma, what have you got? Fabrication, you said. The fabrication is external and the Formation is internal. When formation is there, the three characteristics are known. They will understand what is a formation. And without knowing the characteristics of our Buddhism, that is uh, Anicca, uh, Dukkha, Anatta, yeah. without knowing that they speak about uh, only for fabrication. That is there in Hinduism. <laughs> yeah, well, see, fabrication, the problem I had with fabrication also came from one of the characteristics. It came from the Atta issue. 
because we uh, move in, we live in an industrial time. I know if that came from Hinduism, it's probably before the industrial revolution. Okay. But the thing is, if you're fabricating something, I am fabricating it. You see, I am fabricating it. So to fabricate, there has to be an I. And I, where the word they, formation comes, they, they pursue, we, they pursue the selfhood. They yeah. pursue the selfhood. That is why it is called fabrication. So it is not, it is not fitting into our uh, practice. Yeah. So the question is now, again, for the practitioners saying fabrication, if they understand the principles of Atta and Anatta correctly, they're okay. But if they don't understand uh, that I fabricate is not, not supposed to be going on, they're in trouble. And, and then it causes them to think, 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 and get stuck and not move down the path. Then you have to know that other person you, you see, you have to know the other person. Yep. Is the person going to have a hissy fit and tell you, you know, take a hike, you don't know what you're talking about, get angry at you. Should you, should you press it or should you not? And he kept saying in each section of this, if you can bring the person from the unwholesome uh, thinking to the wholesome, then it'll all work. His underlying statement is, does it work or doesn't it work, is my opinion. Okay. Okay. Um, it would be very, very uh, um, helpful uh, for me if you could uh, reflect on where that uh, passage with Ananda and the Buddha is, because that's a very, <laughs> that's a very helpful description. Um, I must have it in my notes someplace. I'll try to find it for you. I really will. Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, I must have tucked it away somewhere. <laughs> you know, because I, some of these things were so priceless when we found them. We made a note, shoved it in, and I have this big, huge thing. I'll go and look and see if I can find it for you. But he didn't, the thing was, he didn't say anything else. And the thing that impressed me most about it when we found this was that, um, because, um, oh, what it was like, um, it, was, it has to be more than that, he's going to say, you know, more, more, a lot more than that. It couldn't be that simple. And I know what it was. I know what it was. The modern concept, the Buddha would never say, don't teach that person. But you have to go to 15 to understand that, don't you? You have to go to suit to number 15 and take a good look at what that's really about. 15 was a, a 16 things. If the student is working with the teacher real closely, it's perfect. But if four of those 16 things are not working, that teacher shouldn't be spending time with that student because if they do, it's a waste of time. Now, there are some people who are remarkable, remarkable, and remarkable. Those are arahats we can't find, <laughs> you know, who are just going to go on forever patiently with that student till the day they pass away or the student passes away. But most monks don't, he's warning the monks in that sutta sort of, he's letting them know if this is happening, then this is what should not, you should not spend time with this person if they're going to prevaricate like prevarication was a great word. If you're going to give them instructions and instead of saying they understand what you're saying, they go like this, side of like Richard Nixon, you know, well, let me say this about that. And he goes around like this, you know, and then he never answers the question he was asked. He was famous for that. You know, if you're going to do that, well, well, don't work with that person. How can you work with them? If they're not going to take what you say, or if they, if you tell them you, these are about, uh, what is the term they keep using um, the term in that uh, sutta? Oh, uh, what is it? Wait a second. I'll tell you what it is. Um, the um, admonishment is the, is the word to admonish the student. And there's 16 ways uh, that in admonishing your student, you run into these difficult to admonish pieces and Bonte and I talked about it. And basically it was like, if there's four or five of those, you just don't need to do, be doing this. And I've been at retreats where he used to just say, okay, you can just go back, go back and sit. I don't want to talk to you anymore. In the middle of a retreat, if you haven't listened to one thing I've said in five interviews, go back to your seat and just finish the retreat. I don't want to interview you anymore because you're not listening to anything I'm saying. You're mixing things in with it. You know, how, he'll say, you know how I feel about that. You go, you go read the Vajikati Sutta 72, section 18, 
and it tells you very, very clearly that you cannot learn what I'm teaching you if you do this and this and this and this. That's what it tells you in 72. It just says um, uh, it's enough to cause you bewilderment, and this is why you're stuck. It's enough to cause you confusion uh, because this Dhamma is profound. It's hard to see and understand. It's peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, by reading. It means by reading and reasoning and reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise, the one who understands the dependent origination and is watching it is the way we interpret that. It is hard for you to understand what I'm teaching when you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve another teaching, pursue a different training and follow a different teacher. It's basically saying, don't come to me if you're locked in place like that and you're going to argue with me because I don't have time for it. And guess what? I just turned 73 and I don't. <laughs> If you're going to follow what I say after doing what I did last September with that remarkable retreat, I know now I am teaching the right way. If, if you follow what I say, it will work. Even the least person who was arguing in the beginning of that retreat turned right around and saw everybody else was working and by the second or third day of interview was ready to follow instructions. And by golly, gosh, gee whiz, she went from 30 minutes to three and a half hours. There's no saying there wasn't progress for this person. You see? Yeah, <laughs> it was just a remarkable thing. And to be honest with you, was there doubt in my mind whether we were teaching right before that retreat? Probably there was some because I have a hardship here in India. Don't I, Sarma? <laughs> I don't speak Marathi and Hindi. You see? Of course, I won the other night. You know, at Dr. Ambikar's birthday, I was up on the statue and the sponsor, my sponsor said, she can't teach you a lot because she can't speak. And then what happened? He gave me the microphone. And what did I do? I said something, oh my, I said, well, this is about Dr. Ambikar and we put the flowers on Dr. Ambikar. Now let me ask you all a question. Where is Dr. Ambikar? Where is he? I said that to 4,000 people and they went, what's she talking about? And I said, I'll tell you something I know now. You are Dr. Ambikar, you are him. So is he here? Dr. Amakar is here. You are, let me hear you say it. I am, we are Dr. Amakar. So this statue is important and putting flowers on it, that's great. But are you living what he gave you? Cause you are Dr. Amakar. You know what happened? Only four or five days now, there's 40 people that want an instruction one place and 23 kids and their parents who came over here the other night and want instructions. All I had to do was really get to the heart of the matter because the heart of the matter is he taught enough of the Dhamma they could use this practice and it can help them. But they have to understand that he's not here to give anything to them except what he gave them. And now he's waiting wherever he is, whatever happens when you die, he's waiting for you to say, we are Dr. Ambikar. Now we have been given our freedom, given our independence, given a right to pursue our dreams and everything else. So if you're not getting up and going out there and doing that and getting educated, I don't want to hear it. Before I die, I want to hear a much higher percentage of the Dalits and tribes telling me that they are educated. Now it's 10 or 12%. I want to hear 40 or 50% before I die. That's what I want to hear because they are the living legacy of that man and 12 PhDs and everything you can imagine. He's a Renaissance man. But what good does it do to you unless you understand you are Dr. Amakar here now, right now? Oh, I love him. I think he's great, but he's not here. <laughs> so the, prob the, the problem is in India, they pursue selfhood 
second they believe more in incarnation that dr ambedkar or whatever name you are saying he highlighted buddhism but at the fag end of his life he took buddhism and finally he became famous among the down trodden that is poor people you know i got to i got to i got to say one thing in here just for him all right he made one mistake in his whole life all right one big mistake he took them all and they all became buddhists and then he died that Correct. was a mistake that and was they a mistake did, they, and they did not have sunday school yet he I'm studied teaching, i am teaching people now three generations into this thing who don't have the very basics of the the very basics of the foundation they the need very, the very basics of uh, buddhism is uh, three characteristics second is dependent origination if he is understanding even mahayana people also will not understand oh, they will not speak about yes sir but wait a they second will speak, they will not speak about dependent origination they but speak about gotta, only emptiness second. emptiness yeah, is but, properly not known that they have written lot of yeah, books but, mahayana people without understanding still, without understanding they can't. all right now you, now you tell me why they can't and the reason they can't understand that stuff you can't teach that to them is because they don't have dana sila bhavana and sila samadhi panya everybody in the world is skipping dana sila bhavana and they're wondering why the practice won't work yes yes oh my gosh because dana is, is what softens like your heart and prepares your heart and that dana is. isn't just about money and gold it's not about that it's That's about okay. it's, it's about okay. generosity of words and thoughts and words and actions all throughout your life it's about your heart that's why and they believe in the incarnation because they pursue self food and without understanding the basic things eh? that is the only difference i find because i studied lot of hinduism Yeah. i know the, i know all these the problem the fabrication when you mentioned because it is an external one because they pursue the self food without understanding dependent origination no one can understand uh, this hindu and that's one. and that's where we excel right no, no, no. <laughs> not, love, ex- not excel I we, love, we i love generation <laughs> we will not speak like them that's all i know, we, I, know. I know you what do you think <laughs> Uh, uh well yes no i i i i'm in agreement here with both yourself and uh uh sama um that unless we uh have a um a foundation that's based on uh, dana and based on sila then these are the these are the foundations that you build the practice on and without them uh you, you end up with uh, if you like a an intellectual understanding but it's not a, it's not an emotional or a heartfelt understanding the difficulty um, is that we divide things in this world and so when the dana sila people are over here and the meditators are over here we still have this problem this was all like this it was supposed to be a tapestry we were putting back together like this it was supposed to be a dama cloth and we have divided it and in in the west it's even worse i am samata vipassana vipassana samata vipassana samata you might you might go look at the monks fighting in kasambia and they're still fighting out here over samata or vipassana what what happened with samata vipassana <laughs> nobody read the suttas where samata vipassana was hooked together where it was it was hooked together yoked together like two oxen yoked together like two horses pulling a wagon it's hooked together and to pull this wagon like that you see the, the the challenge also is because liberation can be uh described in the suttas as by wisdom or by the chitta and th- then these 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 two groups would also have a dispute between each other as to have, who understood to, yeah but we have to be very careful how we define those descriptions of by by this or by that we have to be very mm-hmm. careful okay and that you know was we live in a time also where uh, the person with the lesser education is really on the 
that's a it makes it a difficult thing for them uh, because they they believe we live in a very complicated time. It comes back to a friend of mine who was hunting for a job in Washington D.C. once, and <laughs> and he was trying to get this job that. I will tell you right up front, he was not qualified for. And he said he could get this job as a programmer in the uh, National Regulatory Commission, no, wait a minute, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, no, yeah, the NRA. And he could get this job, he could, he could. And I said, how do you think you're gonna do that? He says, you watch, I watched. Now I'm a room and resource person, and I watched this man get that job and he was not qualified to have it. How did he do it? Because say Sarma is one, I'm two and you're three, you're him, okay? Sarma comes in, he says, I have the solution for the challenge you're facing. And we're only going to have to have three more job slots. And that way he was, he was chosen for a final uh, you know, interview. And then they let him go. Then I came in, I said, I have the solution for the problem your company has. And we only have to have 10 more uh, people hired. That's all. Okay. And my friend, he knew something about this day and time. He knew about governments. He knew about bureaucracies. He came in and this is you and you come in and you say, now, sir, I know what you have heard before, but this, let me show you how this works. And he put up on the board, a great big graph of the whole problem and everything. And he demonstrated how we only need another department with 31 more jobs. And who got the job? Was it Sarma who was gonna save the money and for everybody and make the problem solve or me? No, it was you. That's how he got that job. He existed in that job for five years without the credentials he needed to be in that job slot. And then they let him go shh, very quietly because they didn't want anybody to audit and find out he was in that position for five years. He was making over $85,000 a year. That's a, It's incredible. It's just incredible it happened. You know, but how he did it was what fascinated me. We cannot have a simple solution. You can't, that is the problem right now in humankind. We cannot. we could in maybe Africa, if we needed more water or something, or we would, everybody in the country, in the country, people figure out things by, by logic and how it works in governments, in highly populated areas, we are just, having a bit of problems now <laughs> a bit of problems. I, I, I can, I can get... something something you are speaking the dana and what is that you said dana something you said when you dana sila bhavana dana, ah, dana sila bhavana that's okay but he was speaking dana and oh what did you say about dana you uh, no, I, I, sa I said that with the dana and sila needed to be foundations of the practice that is true, but at the same time, when you are pursuing selfhood, uh, these things will not matter. The main crux of the problem, they cannot understand this particular anitya impermanence and they, they cannot go to that level. Anitya, anatta and uh, dukkha, they cannot understand. And next step is dependent on even Mahayana also is, has failed because of uh, Paticca Samupada is not known to them. But you know, what I will say here is that the, the monks are not going out and teaching it in the proper way. And mm. we're caught, the monastic structure is caught in a loop right yes. now. Even Vajrayana, Vajrayana and uh, Mahayana are there, two sects are there. They don't know about uh, this Paticca Samuppada. Or well, they, they do, they they do have a lot heard. of things about the yes. emptiness. What is emptiness? They speak volumes and volumes unnecessarily. What is emptiness? They don't understand even. They, they get very upset when I teach our, them. Our, our, our Bante has told only one sutta, Chula, Chula Sunyata Sutta or something. That's right. Here, That's right. The me, me, maximum, maximum meaning or anything of this particular emptiness is given. I, I'll tell yeah. you what it is. Wait, wait, I'll tell you exactly what it is. I know what you're talking about. 162, you know. 162 MN. No, Bante no, has, no. It's 121, 121. Uh, 121, 121, yeah. 121. And the, and the last lines, you see the issue that he is talking about is, <laughs> is the, uh, comes from Nargajuna. And, and then Nargajuna sets up the school for emptiness. But, uh, yeah. but, but wait a second, wait a second. There's more yeah. to Nargajuna just the way there's more to Buddha Gosa than most people understand. Both Buddha Gosa 
and the time that Nargajuna came were times when if we didn't have something miraculous happen, all of Buddhism would have disappeared. And when Nargajuna set up the school of emptiness, he did the best he could, but his attempt, the reason he did the whole thing was to break up the infighting, to stop the infighting, the same reason that Buddhaghosa produced the compilation, let's be honest here, the compilation of a group of commentaries that already existed and tried to put them in, in, a, in one place, in one book, in, in shape that people could follow it. Oh, he, he did that. He got the job to do that because there was a lot of fighting going on and the elders were afraid. If we don't stop this, all of it is going to disappear. That was the grounds for this. So listen to what happened here. We'll tell you really quick for those of you who don't know. Um, the problem with producing a school of emptiness was people took emptiness to mean the wrong thing. We don't know for sure if, if um, we don't know for sure if Nargajuna Eve really understood it uh, the way the Buddha did or not. We're not sure, okay? But um, when you go to the Buddha and he's teaching about emptiness, he teaches a sutta, the Chula Shunyata Sutta and the uh, Maha Shunyata Sutta. And at the end of the, the Chula Shunyata Sutta, uh, it's a beautiful thing because he's telling you now I've been very quickly now I, I was living in the town and I, I heard the, the town and when I went to the forest, I was void of the town when I now only had the sound of the forest when I sat by the tree I was void of the sound of the town and the sound of the forest. Then when I was sitting in meditation, I uh, just fell into the first jhana. Then I was void of the sound of the forest and I was void of the, uh, of the, just the next part. And then he keeps going through all eight levels, the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, four, and you begin to understand the Buddhist teaching. When I'm in the third jhana, I am void of the first jhana and void of the second one, I'm in the third one. When I'm in the fourth, I'm void of the second and the third, and I'm in the and the fourth, and I'm in the fifth, I'm void of the third and fourth and fifth, and, and so forth. So here's listen to the end result so that you can see the difference in the emptiness. Here we go. There is present only this non-voidness, non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on the body. He's sitting there at the end. He can see, hear, smell, taste, and uh, touch the body, and his mind is still operating. And it's conditioned by life. That is the condition for it. We're on page 970 in the Majima Nikaya, okay? And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he still understands that which is present thus, this is present. So whatever you're void of, void of the morning, void of the argument, void of the kids sending him off to school. Now you are just in the house by yourself, mom. Okay. And you're sitting in your, in your meditation. And when you go through the first jhana, then you go to the second, you're void of the first and the third, you're void of the first and the second, the fourth, you're void of the second and third, the, the infinite space, you're void, infinite consciousness, void of what's preceded it until you get to the end. But when you get to the end, this is I why, like now, why would, when you get to the end, remember what I told you about Nibbana. It isn't a place you get to, and it isn't like uh, the end of everything thing that you get to, all right? It's an experience of the opening or the rebooting of your mind. And yes. when you are when you are void of the, the cessation state, void of the experience of Nibbana, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. And what's present? You're still alive. You don't disappear. Sorry. Okay. You don't get to disappear. You're still alive. Your sixth sense bases are working can, based on conditioned by life. You go through the rest of your life and the effects of the opening process that Nibbana was will last as long as you take care of it and feed it. 
So mom, if there's moms here, when you had the baby at the hospital, just remember the, the, the doctor is there and the two nurses and you, and you have the baby. And your husband comes, you wrap it in the blanket and you take it home. Those doctors and those nurses do not come with you. When you go home, the baby is your responsibility. If you go through a rebooting process in this practice where you basically go back to a default mind with no pressure from the past, no pressure from the future, just a clear, clear mind with clear eyes, clear hearing, smell, taste, touch, where everything is clear now, like when you are a baby. Okay, it's going to last as long as you personally take care of it and keep practicing and mind it. And then maybe it can happen again and again and again. Okay, that's how it works. And uh, there's no further thing I can say to you about it in this life. That is how it works. So he's telling you the truth. There isn't a point of emptiness. There cannot be even MIT gave up on outer space which was supposed to be a vacuum the whole time I grew up and finally told me there's something out there. And they said, what? I said, what is it? What is it? It's intelligent goo. <laughs> intelligent something, they said. They don't know what it is, but they are not actually void because when they thought they were void of the vacuum, they even had something to say. So what are we going to explain, you see? Without but, reaching, without yeah. reaching nibbana, doing all anarya jhanas, they started speaking and writing so many volumes without uh, tasting nibbana. That is Everybody the drawback. Everybody wants to taste it. That is the drawback. <laughs> there is a there is a, a there is a man who has his master's degree in Buddhism who will tell you he's from the University of Texas. He teaches English. I don't remember his name. He will tell you that the family of uh, of Gautama. Siddhartha Gautama's family, uh, that the Gautama house, uh, the Buddhists come down through the Gautama house, father to son to father to son to father. I love this whole thing. You know, it's like a, a name and that's what it is. You know, <laughs> and, he, and then Nibbana is basically a place. It's a city. So there resembles, everybody wants to describe Nibbana. I mean, even when I'm telling you this, you don't have to believe me. I mean, that's just the way I look at it. This I-M-H-O, you got it? I-M-H-O. <laughs> Was that right? In my humble opinion, there you go. From all that I've seen, that's what happens. And somebody goes through the opening that can last for a month, another person three days, another person a week. What can I tell you? That's what, when I look at the whole thing, that's what I see, yeah? So it's, I don't have a magic ball. I'm looking for one. <laughs> you know. So Bande, anybody you want else? To speak something? But yeah. they wanted to speak something because it's ah, already 8.30. No, something. no, I thought uh, you wanted to end at 8.15. So I just wanted to remind you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> does, does anybody else? Does it, there are a few people That is why you, you opened your window. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Let's see. Avinash, do you have a question? <laughs> you have a question? Uh, you're on mute, Avinash. Oh, you have to put it. Namaste, Mataji. Namaste. Yeah, uh, I have a question. I mean, on a totally different topic. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, <clears throat> in uh, one of the sutta, Buddha yeah. said, uh, when you practice according to teaching of the Buddha, you're born, if you're not uh, achieving enlightenment, you're born in a Brahma Loka. And when you follow uh, other kind of jhanas, then you're born into the Brahma Loka also. But eventually you will fall on the lower uh, ground. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, what is the difference and another another? Oh, you turned it off. You turned off the speaker. Go ahead. Another what? Yeah. Uh, I mean, another question is when one is, uh, when being in a Brahma Loka, mm -hmm. so, uh, I mean, why he not continue to live there? Because 
he also practiced there also because of ah, the fruit of okay all right let me tell you about so, the brahman locusts a little bit okay <laughs> the deva yeah, locusts yeah. the brahman locusts are not easy places to live okay um and there's a lot of things going on there besides your ability to just sit there and do meditation if you go to a Deva Loka, you're in big trouble. You got to eat all the time. Grapes, 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 grapes. You can't stop eating. Okay. And then you, you have to, to sit, but there's all kinds of beautiful, beautiful things in the Brahma Loka and the Deva Loka. Right, Bhante? Isn't that right? Bhante yes. knows. He can speak to this. But, uh, uh, I will just uh, try and uh, kind of explain that there are suttas which uh, does explain that uh, if you are practicing as per the Buddha's uh, way, and uh, you are attaining jhanas, you can, uh, one of the uh, options is that you can uh, uh, be reborn in a Brahma Loka and after your uh, uh, time is ending, you can uh, uh, attain uh, Nibbana. And uh, for the people who are uh, doing one-pointed concentration or other, uh, which are not following the Buddhas, this thing, then uh, what happens is that it is based on uh, the accumulated karmic uh, benefit. It is like you have uh, got a bank balance. You got a million dollar lottery. You use all your money uh, and uh, you go to a resort and uh, one day you find out that your money is over and they push you out and you don't have uh, money for taxi also. So th that is the situation uh, you may face that you may end up in a hell realm after being in the Brahma Loka. But when you are doing the Buddha's uh, way of practice, you are learning to bend your mind towards the Nibbanic uh, yeah. element. Yeah. You are bending your mind towards what is wholesome. And because of that bend of mind is there, uh, slowly, slowly over time, you reach to the destination of Nibbana. <coughs> that yeah. is how there is a difference. Yes, uh, Sharma. <laughs> yeah, Sharma. Sensual desires is the important because even by living morally, we can go to Devaloka. But when we end up with sensual desires, then only he is eligible for uh, Brahma Lokas, uh, rope of Brahma Lokas or anything. And if he continues and tastes the uh, jhanas, uh, Arya jhanas, noble jhanas, and definitely he will, uh, what you said, Brahma Loka, and he continues to be there forever in such Lokas, and he will end up with uh, other things. <laughs> You know, but sensual desire is more important. That sensual desire, because of sensual desires only, we go to Devalokas and just by way of morally living. And afterwards, we'll come back and uh, take a animal birth or anything for that matter, after completing. And that's what uh, uh, um, Khema uh, Mataji told us in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah sensual yeah, desire yeah. is the main main drawback in the system. But the one, yeah, but the one thing that I told I told you I didn't know about at the time, and I don't even want to, <laughs> you know, David's the thing you dug up about in where was it in and Gutra Nikaya? Angutra Nikaya. There are two yeah. uh, sutras which I have discussed also. Huh? Yeah, well, this is and other sutras also. Huh? This is one of the things that I wish that. Um, well, we brought it up and we tried to explain it here one time. The Janagami. Janagami and Janagami. Janagami. Yeah, and so if a person sits in the jhanas in this lifetime, they can end up as a non-return, you see, as a non-return here. And um, another that it's an interesting thing. The same thing that is true of the anagami uh, can happen for the person that is practicing in the jhanas and the, the higher levels. So it comes out equal to a janagami and, uh, and, and a janagamitra. That was the mita. There's a male and a female one. But I don't really want to get that out again because it's really hard to, to imagine how this is working when we're talking about the levels that we're dealing with and the attainments. So I guess, um, but you end up, uh, if, you, if you go off from being a human being. Another thing, Bonte, I need to ask you, but I said too, like when you're, uh, when you go through one time and you, and you, um, and you have the uh, fruition, then uh, you have seven more lifetimes, see? But the lifetimes, I want you to understand, don't have to be human lifetimes again. They could end up being different kinds of lifetimes. They don't have to end up being on earth after 10,000 world systems are out there. You can end up anywhere coming back to live through another life. 
and you know, I find what I find interesting as a teacher is sometimes a person will show up and you wonder if this stuff for is true or not. And, you know, one time we had a student in North Carolina show up and by the third day of the retreat, the third or the fourth day, she was completely in the fourth jhana and just right there in the fourth jhana. And when she came to the retreat, she knew how to put a, a white sheet on just like this robe. She knew how to put it on, how to wear it. And, it, you know, I resented it because I was wearing a robe and <laughs> mine was falling off and falling down, but hers was staying just right there. And I'm thinking, how did this happen? She didn't know anything about Buddhism didn't know anything about Buddhism and comes to a retreat with a sheet and puts it on like a robe. And then the third or fourth day, she's way deep in the jhanas. And Bhante said, you know, I said to him, how's this happen? That's so quickly. And he said, because in some other lifetime, probably she was meditating to a certain level. And when she sat down suddenly to meditate and she's sitting on the floor, all of a sudden, sitting meditating the the mind this consciousness remembers and there you are so is this stuff true i don't know let's keep going let's find out <laughs> Bante, i wanted to speak one sentence yeah one minute whatever it is said in the anguttak nikaya is is to encourage us to reach the jhana level and other things is okay yeah but at the same time the last cognitive process is more important. Correct. And if at all we practice the same thing and we develop some sort of liking for a particular jhana or anything, if it occurs at the time of last cognitive process, then only what Buddha said in the Agnutta Nikaya will come into truth. In a sense, next it life. Can, it carries you through. It's like it's like um, it's like uh, at the time you're dying, the very last thought is like putting yourself in first gear to get out of here, you know, and and sending you in a direction. That so is that's so important. That, yes, and that is one thing that is uh, one of the reasons we teach you 143. Hmm. We teach you how to die. That's one. My question was when we started to teach this, you know. Um, my question was, the Buddha teaches us a lot of things about our practice and about how to live our life, but does he teach us anything about dying? That's a question I had. And um, yeah, and, and so... Because one thing, one thing, uh, when, uh, Mataji, one thing, because I am coming from so many lakhs of lives, I am bringing my kamma. I don't know mm -hmm. what is going to happen at the time of uh, death. The cognitive process is more important. You're right. You're right. So letting go of letting go of everything, letting go of everything, and trusting what you've been working on in the wholesome for all of your training, that gives you the impetus to go in the right direction as far as you can go. So I see. Okay. Okay. So now, if you have ideas um, about anything you want to talk about, or you know, you want to send questions, please write to me. Um, it's Kanti Kama 2, Kanti Kama 2 at um, gmail.com. And I see Sarah. Do you have a question, Sarah? Are you just coming to pray? <laughs> it's good. Okay. <laughs> I thought this was a fun class. I hope everybody brings a friend next time. We'll have about 20 people here. It really was a fun class. Okay. Here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.